Well, good evening. Let's all stand together. We're going to open our service with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We'll sing the first and the last stanzas. I have found his graces on the Sunday night service. Glad to have you here tonight. Let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, thank you for the study of Joseph this morning that we got to look at in your word. Lord, thank you for all the Sunday school classes that met today and just the word of God that's been taught and preached. We're so grateful uh, to be able to uh, gather together around your word and the Lord uh, gather together to worship your name. Uh, Lord, I'm excited about the, the service tonight. Lord, help us as we uh, look into your word and think about and remember what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, and uh, Lord, thank you for uh, the teen rally as well, uh, after the evening service and this week, and the Vacation Bible School. I pray that you would just uh, work in each heart. I pray that you would strengthen and encourage uh, and revive each heart, and Lord, if there's someone that's never been saved, God, I pray that this week they would come and they would receive you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that people would get baptized. Lord, the church would grow. That you would just use this event uh, to grow your church. Uh, Lord, and I pray that you would be with Pastor as he opens the Word of God tonight. Just fill him with your spirit in a special way and use him as he uh, preaches the Word. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We do have the teen rally right after the evening service. So the teenagers that are here for that, just head straight up to the teen room. And we should be about one hour. Uh, and then we'll be finished out. And then the teen rally tomorrow, uh, the doors will open at 530. The program goes 6 to 830 tomorrow through Thursday night. And then Vacation Bible School, uh, registration closes tonight at 8 p.m. And so try to get that in before that time if you can. Uh, not during church, but uh, right after church. Uh, and uh, go ahead and tomorrow morning, 830 is when the check-in happens. So check-in 830 program is 9 to noon, Monday through Thursday. Because we have a wedding on a Friday that we're excited about. And then team camp, the payment is due one week from today, $75 per teenager. And then youth con is coming up August 1st through the 5th. And then there are two other announcements for the teen rally. If anybody has a basketball goal that we can borrow for a really good game, uh, please see me or text me or let me know. We could really use that, especially tomorrow night as we're hoping to use it. Uh, and then also, um, if anybody has any wigs as well, like uh, fake hair wigs, uh, it's a really good game. If, uh, if anybody has some of those, we can just borrow for a couple days. Uh, that would be a blessing as well. All right, that's a weird announcement, isn't it? Well, if I had one, I'd probably wear it, but I don't. Okay. All right, let's stand together and we'll keep singing. The way of the cross leads home. Let's sing the first and the last stanzas. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no love on this. I should bear hands high on the wings of the In the way of the cross I pass. The way of the cross I go. The way of the cross I go. It is sweet to go. 
I could, I could listen to that all night. Now, that's the song by Heather Sorensen, right? You know, there's a, I was thinking of that. Uh, uh, Heather Sorensen went to Pensacola. Her father uh, is a friend. I've preached with him up in Minnesota, and he's coming out with a book, and Clark Snyder was up there, and they're going to send me a book fresh off the press, maybe even before the press. He's written a um, uh, biography uh, of all of the translators of the King James Bible. Uh, like, for one of them is a great incredible man of God named Lancelot Andrews. Lancelot Andrews would spend six hours in personal private devotions 
in prayer and meditation before he would translate one word of the Bible every day, six hours in personal devotions. Then he would go to work translating the Bible. So that's going to be a great thing. Dr. Sorensen wrote, wrote a great book on, on the textual criticism. So Heather did a great job writing that one. Amen. You know, that one and also uh, uh, And Can It Be, those two songs, you know, boy, if, if we had visitors and said, what do you, what's your ideal music program? The, or choir, those two songs right there, and that would do it right there. Great. How are you tonight? Fine? We welcome you to the table of our Lord tonight. We want to spend some time meditating on Him, contemplating what He's done for us. Don't forget to be praying for the Vacation Bible School. It starts bright and early in the morning, and I'm excited about the youth rally. And so, uh, Brother uh, David Korn and I have been thinking about this uh, for a couple last couple of days. So here's what I want to do. I want, I want our people to enjoy kind of to a degree what some of the young people in the evenings have been enjoying. And uh, so at 7.40 p.m., so the young people will be coming in here at 7.40 p.m. Rather than uh, going somewhere else, they'll be coming in here. And uh, Brother Josh is going to be preaching for us. Josh, where'd you go? And you'll be preaching for us in here. Is that okay? Good. <laughs> what if he said no? I, yeah. Who did, who did I say? Yeah. It's Josh Winstead. Yeah. Was there another Josh here? Yeah. Wednesday. Okay. When did it sound like? I didn't say anything. Okay. Right now, we're going to come in here at 740. All right, so you're dismissed at 740, all right. Wednesday. You know what I thought you were saying? I thought you were saying Winstead. Yeah, I know it's Winstead. Yeah, Josh. What other Josh? Who's on first? Who's on first? All right, good deal. Okay, anyway, so Josh Winstead on Wednesday, 740 a.m. p.m. Oh, okay. You know, I've been doing this all day. I just hate it when I do it publicly. All right, but you can ask my wife. I do this all day long any other time. If I ever do develop Alzheimer's, I don't know if I'll be able to know. I mean, because I've been forgetting things all the time, you know. So anyway, so that's going to be this Wednesday at 7.40. We'll, we'll go ahead and start our service at 7.30. We'll sing a few songs, and uh, my wife will be doing the interpretive dance. And so we... <laughs> I, you know, for those of you that are visiting, you know I'm kidding, okay? Right. <laughs> it's going to be Jaren. But anyway, so... Let's be in our place on Wednesday at 7.30 and 7.40. The uh, teens will come in here. And Brother Josh Winstead on Wednesday is going to be in here with us. Okay, great. We're looking forward to that. Um, let's continue to pray. Th those of you that fasted and prayed last week for this uh, coming Vacation Bible School and, and youth camp, I want to thank you. Last year, it made a big difference. This kind come on up by prayer and fasting. So thank you so very much for that. All right. Let's everybody stand and sing Sanctuary. And speaking of uh, Pensacola, the, if you've ever been to Pensacola College and you hear them sing this, they do that. I think it's called the desk camp. Is that it? The desk camp? When they do that echo? So how many of you ladies in the choir know what I mean by the desk camp? You know, Lord, uh, 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 uh. yeah. Now, RJ, you even raised your hand on that. RJ, do you sing with the ladies on the desk camp? You have my permission. You have my permission. You go ahead and do it. <laughs> Just thinking about that sounds funny, though, doesn't it? I mean, of all people, RJ singing with the ladies. I don't know. I don't know if that would work or not. Well, go ahead. Give it a try, Josh. RJ. <laughs> Josh is over there. That's Winstead. All right. Let's sing. Lord, prepare me. So ladies, do that desk camp, that echo jo uh, jobber. Okay, ready? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. 
I'll be a sanctuary for you. Well, I didn't know the descant was going to be a duet, okay? We didn't have enough ladies sing it. Oh, of course, we, the choir just disappeared too, didn't they? So that, that affected it a little bit, right? Okay. So, Jared, why don't you go ahead and do a falsetta and help the ladies? I know you can do it. Don't look at me like you can do it. It's not appropriate? Well, who's the pastor? <laughs> well, anyway, Jared, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. All right, but I would ask you, how, how many ladies do we have in here? Ladies, okay? You In your register. Sing it in your register. That'd be good, okay? How many ladies in here? By the way, Christ Church, unlike a lot of people in our culture, we know what a woman is, okay? We know what a woman is, so we're going to ask those of you that are women, okay? Uh, see, okay. Uh, I'm looking around here, okay? Well, I need a... There's a woman, okay, right there, okay. That's not a woman. That's a man. That, that would be the bearded lady there, wouldn't it, okay? All right. So anyway, ladies, all of the ladies here, I want you to sing it in that high register, okay? And Jared, you sing it in your register, and I'll just uh, sing the melody line, which is the only thing I can do, all right? And even then, it's a challenge, all right? Okay, good deal. Well, this morning, you know, after it was all said and done, I wanted to run away. I thought, you know, what was I doing anyway? All right. Well, anyway, let's try that. Let me hear you ladies sing that. You know what I mean. That's good. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Good. You're in. Oh, that's good. True. Now let's do that acapella. Come over here, Jared. I love that and what you're doing. I like what you're doing. Okay, come on over here. What? Don't be afraid. You'll be fine. Okay, ready? Let's do that. Okay, good. Embarrassed. <laughs> Just embarrassed. All right, ready? Let's do this. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, With thanksgiving I'll, be I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary for you. You're a good sport. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Josh Winstead, would you come up here, please, and lead us in prayer for the offering? It's been such a blessing being here. Now, there's an age difference between you and Joy. Is that correct? Okay. What would that be? Three years? Okay. All right. So, yeah, so Joy's a little older than you, right? Okay, was she bossy growing up? Absolutely. Uh, whoa! <laughs> well, to me, Joy's the sweetest girl in the world. I can't imagine her being bossy. She had to grow into her name. Okay, grow. Ooh, c come here. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a good night, Wednesday night, yeah. Maybe, maybe, Josh, you can give us some, you know, backstories that we're not aware of, and yeah. Right now? Yeah. We don't have time, Pastor. We no, we don't, don't, yeah. Well... It's a blessing seeing you. Tell me, how many siblings are there in your family? Four. Okay, name off all of them. So there is Jonathan, Joy, Jeremiah, and then they ended with perfection, Joshua. Joshua. Have you noticed that everybody's name started with a J? Yes. Yeah. So that was on purpose? Well, my dad's name was Jeff, and my dog's name was Fluffy. So. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you say you had a dog named Fluffy? I did. Good. Come Good. on, come on. <laughs> Best dog we ever had was Fluffy. <laughs> uh, man, I'm telling you, I still miss Fluffy. She was an old English sheep dog. Um, you threw me a little bit. We thought maybe the dog's name was going to be with a J. Sorry. And your mother's name is started with a? Audrey, so A. A. Okay, well, she's A1, right? Just, there you go. She's a good mother, isn't she? Amen. She really is a great mother. I've met her and uh, Josh. Uh, I appreciate it. And so, Josh, you're the baby of the family, right? Yes, sir. I'm the baby of the family, too. I have always felt like we were mistreated to a degree, right? I, I would agree with yeah. that. Yeah, so whatever you, <laughs> whatever you want to speak on Wednesday night is going to be fine with me. We are glad to have you. Everything I've heard about you has been positive. Of course, I've been talking to the right people, right? But we're so thankful to have you and your wife. How long have you and your wife been married? Uh, coming up on eight years. Eight, coming up on eight years, wow. Well, tell me your children's names. Uh, my oldest is Titus, and Titus? my youngest is Caleb. Caleb, okay, so you didn't go for the first name initial, and then it's, okay, that's fine. Titus is a good name. Titus and Caleb. And Caleb, good Bible names. Amen. Amen. 
So Josh, seriously, I know I joke around a lot, but we are very, very glad to have you. I've been looking forward to having you for a long time here, so can't wait to hear you preach on Wednesday night. And of course, we'll be sneaking around here all through the week. It's going to be a great week. How many have ever been involved in our Vacation Bible School and the youth rallies? They're fantastic. Josh, good to have you here. Lead us a prayer for the offering. Lord God, we love you. We're so thankful, Lord, to be gathered together with your people in your house. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that your blessing would be upon this service. May we lift up Jesus. May we magnify him. May, Lord, we pay attention, uh, Lord, not just with our ears, but open up our hearts to truth, Lord. And may each and every one of us, as we leave the service tonight, may we let our light shine brighter for Christ than when we came. I pray your blessing over the offering, the gift, and the giver. Use this, Lord God, to further the work of your kingdom. For we ask this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, Cassie. Cassie's been a big help helping us get ready for VBS. And I think as soon as VBS is over, she's uh, heading to uh, Pensacola to help at the uh, Camp of the Pines for the summer. So thank you, Cassie. Let's all stand. I am his and he is mine.
was walking in darkness, sad and alone, searching for a love that was real. Then I heard about Jesus, and he saved my soul. Now I want to say how I feel. I'm saved like a drowning man pulled from the sea. I'm saved like a prisoner from captivity. I'm saved like an outcast with a new family. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. And now I a child who's an heir to the throne with a father who owns everything my sin debt is settled and heaven's my home redeemed my soul now can sing I'm saved like a drowning man pulled from the sea I'm saved like a prisoner from captivity. I'm saved like an outcast with a new family. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. drowning man pulled from the sea. I'm saved like a prisoner from captivity. I'm saved like an outcast with a new family. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I am saved by the blood of so much. All right. Uh, Caleb Matthews coming up here for a second. Here, I got your Bible. I just um, want you to be sure to have that. Amen. Left in my office there. Yeah, good. All right. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open up the 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Let's everyone stand. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. This is a passage of Scripture that is most apropos on any night, but especially on a night like tonight. Thank you so much, Josh and Anna. Uh, I couldn't tell when you were going to stop, and to tell you the truth, I didn't want you to stop. It was really good. Thank you. What a great message. And uh, had a great pianist there, too, didn't you? That's not the first time that young lady's played piano for you. Probably you did it when you all were kids, didn't you? That's great. I love it, being reared up in a Christian home. Uh, I couldn't help but reminisce a little bit there. Uh, but anyway, your, the difference between your sister and my sister is your sister can really play the piano. All right. First, and, and sing. <laughs> Judy, God bless you. You know it's the truth. Amen. She, she watches online, so she's probably watching there. But Judy knows it's the truth, all right? Anyway, for, but she's a nice lady, and she was a great Sunday school teacher, okay? There we go. Good. First Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Yeah. 
Uh, I just thought about the worst joke. But anyway, I'm not going to tell it. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. This is the Lord's Supper. So we do want to sober up here as we get ready to prepare our hearts. Verse number 23, 1 Corinthians 11. And I'll try to read slowly. Oh, and ask a question, okay? How many feel like I'm reading the Scriptures too fast, okay? How many feel like that? How many believe I'm, I'm reading the Scripture just right? Okay, how many believe I'm reading too slow? Okay, well, that's good. Okay, good. Um, I was, I was thinking this morning, I was stumbling over some of my words that I needed to slow down a little bit because I got excited. Uh, what happens a lot of times when I'm reading Scripture, I begin thinking ahead about what I'll be saying, and so sometimes I just am not observing as I should. So I'm going to try to observe very carefully the words that I'm reading because these words are so important for the Lord's Supper. Let's read beginning in verse number 23, 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Read with me, if you would, please. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he may come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Let's remain standing while we word of prayer and then please be seated. Lord, as we pull up to the table of the Lord, we pray that our hearts will now be in preparation for partaking of the elements representative of your body and your blood. We do not take this lightly, dear God. We take it very seriously. And we pray that tonight might be a revival as we start our month correctly, honoring you making sure that you are first place in our life and heart. And I pray even for those that are not saved that they'll realize that the bread is representing the body of our Lord that was pierced for our sins, the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sin and gives us by the new birth through the Spirit a new life completely. And I praise you and I thank you, Lord, for that new life that we celebrate in Jesus on this night do be with us this very important week as we start in Vacation Bible School and Youth Rally. And do bless the upcoming wedding this Friday. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. I want to ask six, six questions, six questions tonight as we prepare a heart for the Lord's Supper. The Bible said in verse number 28, but let a man examine himself. Examine himself. Of course, this goes for the ladies too. Let a Lady, examine herself. The Bible says in verse number 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. I've often thought about this. If we allow the Lord to correct us in meditation and personal repentance, the Lord will teach us on our knees before Him, or in our prayer time, however you pray, before Him. He will teach us in our personal prayer and our meditation and walk in the Word, what even otherwise have had to teach us through chastening. And that's what the Bible was referring to in verse 31, 1 Corinthians 11, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So God says, if you don't deal with your sin, if you don't deal with the problems that are in your life that's breaking the fellowship between you and the Lord, God says, then I will take matters in my own hands. I remember my mother often saying to us in our youth, she said, I'm going to tell you something, son, if you think that you're getting away with anything, you're not. 
Because I remember she said, she often would say this, mother can chasten you, but if God has to chasten you, it's going to be a lot worse than mothers. And I want to say amen to everything my mother taught me on that matter. That is so true. Don't ever think for a moment that you're going to get away with something because it was not discovered. Be sure, the Bible says, your sin will find you out. And notice the Word of God says, you can be sure of that. You can be certain of that. But I have six questions I'd like for you to, with me, ask yourselves tonight as we come together to the table of our Lord. One of the two ordinances, and both ordinances reflect the gospel. Baptism, one ordinance, represents the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. The table of our Lord represents the body of the Lord broken for us and the blood that was shed for us. Matter of fact, it says, verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And why is that important? Because it is the preaching of the cross to those who perish. Oh, yes, this is the point that can be delivering you from perishing. But to us which believe, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Question number one, will you let God show you anything that brings offense to Him? Have you ever prayed that? Lord, show me if there's anything that is offensive to you. Lord, I want to be for what you're for. I want to be against what you're against. Or as the old farmer would say, I want to be again what you're again. The Bible says in Psalm 26 and verse number 2, examine me, O Lord, and prove me Try my reins and my heart. Try me. The word try there comes from a Hebrew word, bachan, which means to test. And it says, when I was looking up the definition here, it means to test, especially in metals, in metals. In Act Two, The Tempest, Gonzalo charges Sebastian and Antonio, you are gentlemen of brave metal. You would lift the moon out of her sphere if she uh, would continue it in five weeks without changing. Men, gentlemen of brave metal, try me, Lord. Try me. Test me, especially in reference to a metal that's being tested. I remember when I worked at Inland Steel Mill in Chicago when I was going to college, I learned a little bit more about metals. One of the most interesting metals that God has allowed man to make has to be tempered steel. Tempered steel, it is an amazing steel that it can just uh, take incredible uh, trial, but it holds firm because it's made in such a way to stand up against, for instance, the wind. If you've ever been in a very tall building, and whether that's in Chicago or New York or even downtown, I've been in the Penzoil building downtown in, in Houston. By the way, has anybody ever been to the point, one of the points, I should say, not just the point, but how it comes to that point? Anybody been to the point in the Penzoil, in, 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 in Penzoil Tower? Anybody ever been that downtown? Oh, brother, it's downright scary, isn't it? Uh, uh, I remember one of our church members, were, were, he was working up in one of the very uh, tall, uh, I don't know how many stories up, but he said, Pastor, I want you to stand right there. And I came to the point, and I'm telling you, the reason it was so creepy is because it looks like you're standing over nothing, but while you're standing there, even on a day that's not terribly windy, here's what you're experiencing. The building is swaying. You say, well, what keeps the building from breaking? One word, tempered. The still has been tempered. You know, the Bible speaks very strongly about the destruction of temper. The tempest, even in the same root of temper, the Bible says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Many times people will lose their temper. It's a good thing to say, Lord, examine me, prove me, try my reins. Lord, test me. Lord, temper me. Help me, Lord, not to say what I should not say or say what I should say. Number one, will you let God show you anything that brings offense to Him? Will you let Him show you? Show me. Try me. 
show me. Number two, will you obey what God reveals to you? The Bible says in Job 34, 32, make note of that, Job 34 and 32. Here's what it says. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. You know, the Bible speaks of sacrifices for the sins of ignorance. I, I remember years ago hearing a man say, you know, uh, you can't do wrong without knowing that you've done wrong. And I thought it sounded good, and he gave some reasons, but he didn't even give any scripture for it. God is so holy, and we are not. Like the song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. By the way, there's an amazing story about the man who wrote those words, how that he got away from the Lord several years, and there was a young lady on the train ride that was singing to herself, and she had a hymn book with her, and the man said, that sounds familiar. She said, it's the most wonderful song. Listen to these words. And he began to weep as she was quoting the words to that great hymn. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy court above. He began to weep. He said, lady, young lady, I wrote that song. So what I'm saying is that many times wrong comes into our life so subtly that we at first don't recognize it. The Bible warns us not to quench the Holy Spirit, not to grieve the Holy Spirit. But what happens is the devil gets just a little foothold. Will you obey what God reveals to me? Can you pray, Lord, that which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. If you reveal to me this is wrong, then it is over in my life. Most every mature Christian that I know has a conviction that maybe others do not share. And sometimes we must take this as an attitude. Others may, but I cannot. Others may, but I cannot. Joshua got real personal when he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and he is saying that this is the way that we will serve the Lord, and this is the decision as the head of the house that he must make. Number one, will you let God show you anything that brings offense to him? Will you let him temper you, try you? Will you obey what God reveals to you? Number three, can you do what you're doing for the glory of God? 1 Corinthians 10.31 is a verse that I would challenge everybody, especially the young people, to memorize. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. I remember well when there was no warning on uh, cigarette packages or uh, uh, advertisements from the tobacco in industry. I remember the uh, airways being filled with uh, tobacco commercials. Uh, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. I always like to revise that. Winston tastes bad like the last one I had. Or Marlboro, uh, remember the cowboy came riding in to the tune of some great uh, majestic theme. Uh, he was looking for Marlboro country. Interesting to note that the man who made that advertisement died of cancer that was directly caused from tobacco. But I, re I remember when it was controversial. I can remember in my youth that there was a guy that had a nervous condition and the doctor actually advised him to smoke a pipe. <laughs> what a strange thing as you look back now. Listen, don't stay depressed. Die of cancer instead, you know. Uh, so when it was still in the controversial state, I was a very young preacher in my teens and I remember challenging young people that were tempted with tobacco to say this. If it's okay to smoke, Next time you pull out a cigarette, why don't you pray this prayer? Lord, bless this cigarette from the nourishment of my body. And as I breathe that smoke down deep into my lungs, fill me also with the Holy Spirit. Well, I remember when I was saying that, adults were gasping. I was so brave when I was a young preacher, huh? But it's still true. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. Do all for the glory of God. 
Uh, you're with your family together. You're going to watch uh, something uh, on the TV. You're going to watch something through the video. Lord, bless this night. Help us to learn some morals here. Help us, oh God, to learn some lessons. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. I remember that time when you've heard me tell about when my wife and I were in the early days of our courtship and I walked her up to the door and I had this very strong desire to kiss her goodnight and the Lord had spoken to my heart about whether therefore I eat or drink or whatever I do, do all for the glory of God. And, I, and uh, so, so I remember uh, uh, the Lord really spoke to my heart, don't do anything while you're dating to ever on purpose arouse you or the person that you're dating. And I remember uh, uh, as I was standing there, I was contemplating uh, trying to put a smooch on her. The question is, would she have allowed it? I guess we'll never know because I didn't go through with it. <laughs> uh, I've done this for the young people whenever I preach at youth camps and stuff. I say, I remember I was contemplating kissing her and the Lord spoke to my heart. And Johnny, what are you doing? I said, well, Lord, I'm, I'm going to kiss Barbara goodnight. And he said, Johnny, can you do that for the glory of God, whether they're for you eat or drink or kiss the girl? Can you do it for the glory of God? I humorously just say, yes, Lord, I, I, I could try for the glory of God to kiss her goodnight. Johnny, are you thankful that you had a good time with her at the rescue mission? She played the piano and I was leading the singing. I am, Lord. Well, then give me the praise. Give me the praise. Because I knew in my heart that if she was the one for me, we'd have a lifetime of kissing. So we can wait. So I remember praying and thanking the Lord for the good time that we had. Whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. I will tell you, tell you this, my wife was a much better girl than I was, a boy. But I'm so glad that God spoke to my heart two years before I met her, the way to conduct myself on a date, anything. Whether therefore we eat or drink. Or how about when you make a prayer request for somebody, and we'll be touching on this in just a moment, but, you know, sometimes even a prayer request, if we're not careful, can be, can be tainted with gossip. Now, I want you to take this as a matter of prayer. Did you know, brother, so, did you know, sister, so-and-so? Now, wait a minute. First of all, did you spend much time in prayer with them? And are you enjoying selling someone down the river? Are you actually enjoying sharing a little gossip? You know, the Bible says in James chapter 4, speak not evil one of another brethren. So in this conversation, what I'm going to share with you about this brother or sister in Christ, can that bring glory to God? If it's really that concern, uh, you're concerned, you're that concerned about it, would you can't think about approaching that person and asking them, can you pray with them about this certain issue that you're bothered with? Number one, will you let God show you anything that brings offense to Him? Number two, will you obey what God reveals to you? Number three, can you do what you're doing for the glory of God? It's a great, a great way to approach anything that you're doing and everything you're doing. Can you do this for the glory of God? Hmm. Number four, has pride come in the way? We spoke about this the other night, so we're not going to belabor this point. But let me share with you three verses. Psalm 37, 35, I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. So prideful, like a peacock. Like a green bay tree spreading himself. Uh, Psalm 73, 6. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Isn't that amazing? He says pride compasseth as a chain. There's something that is bondage bringing about pride. Pride brings bondage to your spirit and your soul. And eventually even to your body. Uh, Proverbs 11, 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. With the lowly, with the humble is wisdom. But pride brings shame. So as we come to the Lord's table tonight, ask yourself, has pride come into the way? Is it standing in the way between you and your Lord? Number five, are you willing to humble yourself to become a conduit of God's blessing? Let me read you a scripture that is not directly relating to the point that I'm trying to make, but I'm going to use it as a vehicle to carry the truth that I want to bring to your attention tonight. This is said of, jo uh, this is said of Josiah by the prophetess. 
Here's what she said, 2 Corinthians 34, 27. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Because you were tender-hearted like a child, and you humbled yourself before God, you're willing to become a conduit of God's blessing, that great blessing. You know, uh, it's interesting to note that this is the word that came to Josiah. You know, when I'm thinking about conduit for a moment tonight, I'm thinking about what it says in 2, Corinthians, sorry, 2 Kings 20 and verse number 20. And this is the passage that doesn't deal directly with the subject, but it's what I'm using as a vehicle. And the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah made a conduit. When Israel, especially, uh, not just Israel, I should say, but Jerusalem would get under siege, the water would be cut off until Hezekiah built his tunnel or this conduit. When my wife and I were in the Holy Land, we went through Hezekiah's tunnel that was built in these times in the B.C. Now, for those of you that ever have any slight claustrophobia, I would advise you, if you ever go to the Holy Land, do not go through that tunnel. Because what happens is, and by the way, many of them say that when this tunnel was dug by the direction of Hezekiah, it was a miracle because they went through this great, gigantic wall of solid rock and you had diggers on this side and diggers on that side and they would break through the rock, chisel through the rock and as they were chiseling through, they were able to meet. The likelihood of that being missed, the likelihood of someone coming from this direction landing here and someone from this direction landing here would be very likely for them to meet the way they did in the middle of the rock, this great rock wall, they say, even over there in Israel, that it was a miracle. But I will tell you this, if you start on either side and you start going in through the tunnel, the closer you get to the middle, the closer the walls get to you. And while you're going through there, you're going through water that's between your ankle and your knee. And it's very, very cold water. So this kind of adds to the whole creepiness of it. So I can remember as we're going through the tunnel, I broke out in cold sweat because the walls were getting closer and closer. I felt like I was in a casket. One reason I think I have this tendency to claustrophobia is when my brother and I were playing hide and seek, uh, I remember I found a clothes hamper, one of those old-fashioned clothes hampers that had a lid like this, and I was just big enough to barely get inside of it. David found out that I was there, and he sat on that thing for about 15 to 20 minutes, and I couldn't get up. Mom and Dad were gone, and I couldn't get up. And so my brother gave me claustrophobia. David, if you're watching, it's still claustrophobic. Thank you very much. So I've been able to slam my sister and my brother tonight, so I need to repent before we come to the table, right? But I remember when we got to the dead center of it, he says, now you're in the center. And now this is really what was scary, because that's a long tunnel. It felt like it was three miles long. It wasn't that long. But we're in the center, and I knew now that we're only halfway through this. And now the walls are so I mean, they're so close that I couldn't even do like this without touching the wall. And then when we're there standing in this cold water, he turns out the lights. So he turns out the lights, and I'm putting my hand here, and my mind goes back to uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, premature burial. And I think this is, I, you know, I, I feel like screaming. You say, why didn't? Because my wife was standing right there, and I didn't want to look like a sissy. Uh, Barbara has been able to come to the sharpest pinnacle in the Grand Canyon without any fear, and she's been able to stand in the middle of Hezekiah's tunnel without any fear, and I am trembling. <laughs> Listen to me. But that conduit that Isaiah, or rather that Hezekiah made, provided the people with water so they would not die. A conduit. A conduit. 
Oh, that we might surrender to be that channel of blessing for God, for the water of life, for the power of the Lord to run through us, to bless us, to be a blessing to other people. Are you willing to humble yourself to be a conduit for God's blessing? This is what Josiah did. He was tender. He humbled himself, became that conduit. Would you be a conduit before your brother or sister in Christ? Proverbs 6, 3, do this now, my son. Deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Be the conduit of God's mercy and grace if there's a friend that has something against you. Take the initiative. Approach the brother or the sister. Too many times what happens is that someone gets a burr under their saddle and they go to the preacher, they go to the Sunday school teacher, they go to a deacon, they go to somebody else, and they want you to fix it between them. Did you know Matthew 18 is very clear on the matter? If there's aught between a brother, then you go directly to that brother. If you don't like the way someone's living or the deeds that they've committed, don't go tattletelling to someone in the church authority before going to them. By the way, there is a protocol. If there's a brother that's really in sin, then you approach him. If he doesn't respond to your one-on-one, -on -one, then you take another brother with you. And then if they don't respond, then the Bible says, then you go to the church. But too many times you want to go to the church without going directly to the brother. Don't raise your hand on this because I know the answer. Have you found that many times the problems between you and someone else is semantics? or a misinterpretation, or you didn't hear the whole story, it is amazing how communication can straighten out that which is crooked. One of the first things that's sacrificed when we talk outside of a problem between you and anybody is the truth. Some of you may remember playing the little game called gossip. Maybe there's eight or ten of you that get into a circle. And you start with a person here, and you tell the person next to you in a whisper a certain statement. Inevitably, by the time you come around to the person next to the one that started the statement, it's not exactly, sometimes not even near what you begin to say. And so oftentimes, when you begin to go to other sources about a problem, rather than going directly to the problem that is the offense, it often gets misconstrued and taken out of context or not even told properly. Do this now, my son, Proverbs 6, 3. Deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Isaiah 59, 14, and judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Truth, fallen in the street, equity cannot enter. When truth is fallen in the street, that means a pathway of righteousness, equity cannot enter. I remember one time a fellow professor of mine, a friend of mine, and I were talking about what's the best car in America. And at that time, I told him I thought the best car in America was the Buick Riviera. I thought that was the best car in America. Great engine, great body look, just everything about it was really nice. And he was telling me that he was in downtown Chicago, and, you know, in a lot of these big cities, they have these one-way alleys. And there was this Buick Riviera, a new Riviera that was coming down this one-way alley, and it had car trouble. And before it got to the entrance, near enough to be pushed out of the way, it stalled. And he said, Johnny, I couldn't believe it. He said to us, he said, he said, brother, there was a line of traffic behind that stalled Buick. You couldn't believe how long that lineup was because one car broke down. The entire traffic stopped. It shouldn't have broken down. It was a nice car. It had a great engine, had a great uh, history. But this car was broken. It was fallen in the street and therefore, there was no ingress, or rather egress, from that alley. Everyone stopped. When truth is fallen in the street. You know, there are things that we should do and should not do. Let us see what God wants, and let us with truth do like the Bible 
tells us to do. Look into the perfect law of liberty. Do not be like one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and forgets what manner of man he was. Therefore, let us be a hearer and a doer of the word and work, not a hearer only. Sir Oliver, or Lord Cromwell, uh, Cromwell, said this when someone was painting him. He said, paint me, warts and all. Don't leave the warts off. Paint me as you see me. And that sometimes is hard to do, but if we are to come to the table of our Lord correctly, we need to humble ourselves to be a conduit of God's blessing. And if we're not being truthful with ourselves, the truth has fallen in the street, and therefore the pathway of righteousness is hindered. Let us be that channel, channels only, that God would listen to us, that, we, that, that God would hear us. For the Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And then finally, one other question. Is the person of Christ nearer and dearer to you than he ever has been? I often ask myself this question and make this prayer. If you have your Bibles, look over here to the Revelation chapter 2. Is the person of Christ nearer and dearer to you than he ever has been? It has been said, if you're not as close to Jesus as you once were, that means you're backslidden. I was thinking about this just recently. And I, and I don't know that I've ever said this in, in the pulpit, but I said it a week ago Saturday night. We were talking about um, where we were many, many years ago at Prestonwood Baptist and where we are right now at Christ Church Baptist Fellowship. And a week ago Saturday, I said, uh, I believe with all my heart that I'm as close to the Lord Jesus Christ as I ever have been. More dedicated, more, more, more transparent before the Lord than I ever have been. I would, like, I would like always the results of that to be on hand. To see the fruit of God's blessing on that. But we're not to measure our closeness to the Lord by popularity or by numbers, or by what other people say. It's something that is between you and the Lord. In Revelation 2, here's what the Lord says here in verse number 2. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they were apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. They had the right creed, but there was something desperately lacking in their deed. The measure of our Christianity, especially before the world, is not measured by our creed as much as it is measured by our deed. Our creed is important, and this you ought to have done, but not to have left the other undone. For if our deeds do not match up our creed, we're sounding brass and tinkling cymbal because we're not operating in the love of God that separates us from this world unto the Lord. Our talk talks and our walk talks, but our walk talks louder than our talk talks. So Jesus says to this very fundamental Bible-believing church, you've done well with your creed, but there's a problem in your deed. Here's what he says in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. The wording there is not lose. Many times it's interpreted that way. You've lost your first love. No, no, no. That's not what Jesus said. He said you left your first love. It's something you did on purpose. If I've lost something, which is I'm, I'm prone to do every day, I look for it. I look here, and it's not there. I look here, and it's not there. I look here, and it's not there. I've lost it. I don't know where I put it last. But if I left something, like today, there was some antibiotics that I was required to take for some of the... Uh, uh, surgery that I had last week, and uh, so on the way to church with my mother-in-law, it dawned upon me I forgot the medicine. So as soon as I could, I went back home, and I went to exactly where it was because I didn't lose it. 
I left it. I knew exactly where it was. I was able to put my hand on it. Within three seconds of walking in the house, I had it in my hand. That's what Jesus said. You didn't lose it. You left your first love. You walked away from your first love. Many times when that is quoted, it's often emphasized as lost instead of left. And then the next verse is not read, which is a shame. Because right after it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, this is what Jesus says, because thou hast left thy first love, he said, remember. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of the place, except thou repent. Christ is the light of the world. I'm going to take away the candlestick. You're not going to be able to lift up the light because you're not right with me. You've got the creed, but your deeds don't match up. I'm not going to let you keep preaching Jesus when you don't live for Jesus. So what did he say? He said, you've left your first love. You know exactly where you left it. You knew exactly what you stopped doing. You know exactly what you started doing when you began to drift away from me. So what does he say? Repent. Admit it. And then he says, repent. And then he says, do the first works. Sometimes the couples retreat, I'll remind the couples that whatever it took to bring you into love is what it will take to keep you there. The Bible says in Hebrews that Christ upholds all things by the word of His power. His power holds together. The Bible says that Christ wins the church how? By preaching. Preaching what? Preaching. The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Christ wins His bride by His words. He holds His bride by His words. He said to Simon Peter, the devil, Satan, has wanted to sift you as wheat, but, conjunction, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So Christ wins the bride by His word. He holds the bride by His word. By that same token, a husband oftentimes, when he's courting his wife-to-be, he will write her love notes, he will speak to her, he'll look at her eye-to-eye. When their marriage begins to drift, he's not looking her so much in the eye anymore. He's taking more attention to the paper or to something on the screen, ignoring her. He's drifting away from her, and he doesn't even realize that he left his first love because he stopped doing those things that brought them into love relationship. It can work on the other way also for the wife, the things that she used to do when he would come home from work, how she would maybe pretty up and and, and, and greet him at the door and welcome him home and and, and maybe just, they used to say, the way to a man's heart's through his stomach and maybe there's that certain dish you couldn't wait to to fix it for him and then the years come and they go and, and he says, what's for supper? Fix it yourself, lazy. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, what happened? She's not doing that which was very uh, much telling him, you're special to me. That's why I made that dish. And even when I didn't have the money to make the dish, I made the best hamburger helper I could for you, sweetheart. Now, I'm just using these as examples. I'm not, don't go home tonight saying, you see, Brother Pope said, you ought to cook me really good food all the time if you really love me. Or don't go home saying, you heard what the what pastor said, don't do any email, don't do anything. As long as I'm in the house, just stare at me. You know, I, don't go home and do that, okay? What I'm saying is, watch this, you know what it, you know what you were doing when you were close to the Lord. I remember very well when I began to get revived, my prayer life was revolutionized. I started to talk to God like He was real, and God became real to me. I began to read the Word, and I began to let the Word of God read me. And I would not put my head down on the pillow at night without getting in the Word. And no Bible, no breakfast. I got real serious about this. Carry tracks with me everywhere I go when I first fell in love with the Lord Jesus with all my heart. I still remember uh, when I won my very first soul to Jesus Christ and how thrilling it is and how thrilling it was. And I have to tell you, even now when I win somebody to Christ, the thrill is still there. But if I go for a long time without winning someone to Christ, if I read my Bible just to get it done, to check it off, if I pray just so I have spent the time with the Lord and I'm not really trying to get God uh, to, to get into God's perfect will and to get in that place 
where it's a th- what I call the thin place, what the Irish call the thin place when heaven is so close and the earth is so close that it's a thin place between you and God. You, you know what you were doing when you were there. So we're saved by grace through faith, but remember when you're saved by grace through faith, it says we are his workmanship. Right after it said, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works. It's those good works that don't save us, but it's those good works that bring us close to the Lord. I want to tell you that I pray a prayer that I pray every day. Every day, here it is. Lord Jesus, I love thee. Help me to love thee more. In two books, A.W. Tozer quoted Nicholas of Cusha in the pursuit of of God, the pursuit of God, and the knowledge of the holy. It so moved Tozier that he placed it in two of his books. It was a quote by Nicholas of Cusha, probably just right at 800 years ago. And here's the quote. Here it is. And what, Lord, more is my life, save the embrace, wherein thy delightsome sweetness does so lovingly enfold me. Let me say it again. And what, Lord, more is my life, Save the embrace wherein thy delightsome sweetness doth so lovingly enfold me. So tonight as we sit at the table of our Lord, is the person of Christ nearer and dearer to you than he ever has been before? If not, why not? And if not, if you've left your first love, remember, repent, and do a redo. Remember what it did, what was going on when you were close to Jesus. Repent on where you're at right now and do a redo. Do again. Do it again. Heavenly Father, bless now as we come to your table to search our hearts, to do what the Bible says here, examine ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to prepare our hearts for the table of the Lord as we think about this body that was broken for us, which is symbolized by the bread. Let us pray over this thing and think about this for a moment because it is so desperately important that we consider this. I'm going to wait one moment here, and then we're going to dismiss the size to come and go ahead and get the elements of the Lord's table. Remember, on the far ends is the gluten-free bread, okay? So keep that in mind as we prepare our hearts for the table of the Lord. and ask the far wings to come on down and go ahead and take the elements of the Lord's Supper and go on back to your seat after that.
That night before our Lord died upon the cross, he took the bread that remained of the Passover. He instituted the table of our Lord, and he broke the bread. And I would imagine the expression on the disciples' face prob faces probably changed a little bit when he said, this is my body broken for you. So now he is not merely talking in symbol. He's saying what he's about to do. And so he was saying to do this in remembrance of me. So whenever you break the bread together, Remember what I did for you. He never wants us to forget what he did for us. And when I think about that bread that is broken and it's distributed, and we still do it the old-fashioned way, our deacons break the bread or their families break the bread and get it ready for us to take the Lord's table. With every break, every crack that you see in the bread, we're remembering just how tremendously loved we are by the Lord who was whipped and beaten and pierced for us, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him by, by his stripes were healed. Don Knowles, if you'll come forward, please, I'm going to ask you a prayer of praise and thanks for the body of our Lord that is represented and symbolized by this bread. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful that you gave us this table, that you gave us this reminder, Lord, we're so thankful for the gift of salvation. Lord, where we would be without you, Heavenly Father. And I know that we need you more. We need more people standing up and remembering you as we go through this world as we are today. So just, again, we're just so thankful and ask for your great many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Don. And as uh, I'll wait for you to get back to your seat there, Brother Don. As we take this bread, I want us to eat this. And as we eat it, remember his body broken for you, specifically, generally for all of those who believe upon him, but specifically also for you, my friend. He did this for you. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he had you in mind. Do this in remembrance of him. We're going to sit here for just one moment, and we're going to prepare to take the juice, which represents the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ.
cup and we think about what the Lord did for us, as we see that blood as in our mind's eyes, as we see that blood coming down the cross from his hands, from his feet, from his brow, from his back, we see the blood. And then when he died upon the cross and said, It is finished, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit, they pierced the side and outflowed blood and water, showing how that his heart, which the Bible prophesied in Psalm 22, was like wax. It melted in the midst of his bowels, in the midst of his bowels. And so when we see that blood coming, as it sprayed those around him when they pierced him, I'm reminded of the great cost, of the high cost that it took. As we think about this blood that was shed for us, I'm going to ask Brother Kruger Corn, if you would please, sir, come over here and lead us in a prayer of praise and thanksgiving for the blood of the Lord Jesus, represented by this little simple cup tonight. Our dear, most gracious Heavenly Father and our God, Lord, thank you so much for this display of love that you showed on the cross as you bled there, Lord. And we know from your scripture that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So, Lord, thank you for doing that. We need you so much. And, Lord, we can't do anything without you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So as you take this cup, contemplate exactly what was happening on that cross when he shed his blood for you. And as we heard Brother Kruger referring to the scripture that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Amen. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, at the Lord's table, the first one, the Lord Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. Remember, Peter didn't want him to do that. He said, well, just wash everything. Wash the whole. No, 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 no. He said, you've already been washed, but your feet are dirty. And so what happens is you don't get born again again. You get born again one time, but then sometimes we get dirty feet, don't we? And we need a fresh cleansing of the Lord, not for positional salvation. We have that once and for all. But when we allow something to creep in our life, now is a good time to repent. Remember, repent, and redo. Let's do this, please, in remembrance of him. Drink ye all of it. Lord, for his unspeakable gift. Thank God for what he's done for us. David Bertrand, if you'll come forward, please. I want you, Brother Bertrand, if you would, to lead us to the throne of grace and give God praise and thanks for the blood of the Lord Jesus and the body of our Lord broken for us. How precious he is. Unto you that believe, the Bible says, he is precious, Brother David. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that we can participate in this service. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us, the forgiveness that you've given to us through these procedures. We thank you for the shedding of your blood. And, Father, we thank you for all that you have done in forgiving us our sins. Help us, Lord, to be worthy. Thank you so much for the service tonight, for the uh, presentation by our pastor. We thank you for the fellowship of our church. Bless us, Lord, as we go from this house. Help us, Lord, to remember, to remember what we have learned here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. David, I'm going to get you to help me with this. We're going to get ready for the Lord's table, and I mean, for we just had the Lord's Supper, but I mean the invitation, amen. Let's everybody stand, if you would, please. If tonight you need to be saved, please meet me here. We'll have somebody show you in the Bible how to know Christ as Savior. Tonight, if you need to rededicate yourself, we've got plenty of altar space. Just be careful as you work around these tables. If you need to be baptized or join the church, then we can talk about this tonight. I know that we were going to be ready for baptism tonight for some folks, but they're not feeling well tonight, so that probably won't happen. So anyway, would you lead us in what? Cleanse me, search me, oh God. Good, good. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Thee, Lord, for 
cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it holy thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. Oh, Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. Send a revival, start the work in me. You can be seated. Pastor's getting ready to baptize after all. We will see one or two, perhaps. Why they get the screen. There we go. All right, who's got a request? All right, I'm going to go with Josh Kirkdorfer right here. 236. All right, nearer my God to thee. Seventy-six. All right. Seventy-six. Oh, it's favorite. All right. Pastor's favorite. There you go. Ready? Great God of wonders, all thy praise, all our matchless God, all thy glory. 
right, Benjamin Daniel Wilcox. Ben, have you prayed and asked the Lord to come into your heart and life? Yes, sir. Amen. And you want the world to know that you're a Christian, right? That's right. That's right. I like that. Amen. Good deal. All in favor of Ben Wilcox being a member of Christ Church Baptist Fellowship. How about a good hearty amen? Amen. My dear brother Ben, according to your public profession of faith and in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my dear brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Blessed Holy Spirit. Bearing the light of the dead <laughs> and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Way to go, Ben. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Well, it was a pleasure to baptize Ben. Not only was he ready to get baptized, he just nearly baptized himself. That was amazing. All right. Thank you, Ben. God bless you, buddy. Yeah, I said, usually when I'm talking to people who are getting ready for baptism, I say, when I pat you on the back, that means get limp in the knees, and I'll take you under, bring you right back up. I patted him on the back, and down he went. I just, all I had to do was just barely shove his head under. It was over. But we praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Ben. God bless you. Y'all pray for Ben. He's a fine young man. We're glad to have him in our church. He had seen us online. He came to Wednesday night service and a Sunday night service, and he knew he needed to get baptized. He had already asked the Lord to save him and come into his heart, but he was ready to follow the Lord in baptism. And I haven't said this for a while, but I remind you, baptism is the first step of obedience after you're saved. In the Bible, when people got saved, then they got baptized. Not before, but after. It shows the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. All right, Brother Matthew's coming up there and close us in prayer. Brother David, is there any announcement we need to remind them of? I'm looking for a basketball goal and some weights. Ah, Brother Corn is looking for a basketball goal and weights. Like wigs. Wigs. I'm sorry. I'm not hearing as well either. He's looking for wigs. And so, Brother Jared, if there's any laying around the house. Okay. All right. Good. I do have one. All right. Anyway, good. Brother Matthew. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll be we'll be dismissed together. Let's stand, and we'll pray. Also, whoever, whichever deacon is responsible for getting these tables down, if you would, just leave these two tables right here, and we'll use them for VBS, so these two tables right here. All right? Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for this, the message. Uh, we thank you for our church, and Lord, and uh, the opportunity we have to come here and hear your word preached and uh, to observe the Lord's table. Lord, we ask that you would bless uh, the hour ahead as the teen rally uh, starts, uh, that you would work there as they have a good time of fellowship, but also more importantly as they uh, think about your word and the challenges there and then VBS tomorrow be with all the workers and help and uh, just bless the week. Uh, we love you. Thank you for your many blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. By the way, registration closes in about 15 minutes, so you still got a chance to get online registration. <laughs>